did you get what you wanted for Christmas? My dad was in the Second World War. He was in basic training in Louisiana. And things that he tells us, or he used to tell us about that, is that uh, they forced him to take salt pills because they thought the soldiers were sweating out too much of their liquids, so they had to drink more. And he gagged on those. And he remembers the snakes coming through the pillows where he was sleeping in the camp. But he also remembers a Christmas where the sergeant said to them, we're going to have a gift exchange. And they were so excited about that. And the sergeant said, we're going to get new socks today. And they were really excited about that because everybody had been tromping around in the mud and the water and their feet and their, their shoes and their socks were horrible. And so the sergeant said, you exchange your socks with you. You exchange your socks. <laughs> Everybody got a new pair of socks. Oh, yes. Here we are in the presence of God, and God has given good gifts, and uh, we have many things uh, to give back in return. This time of year, we often think about making New Year's resolutions. Let's spend some moments in prayer, uh, pledging ourselves anew to our God. Gracious God, thank you for the gift that you give us, overflowing abundant, in rich measure, day by day increasing. Not only the bounties of the world around us and the loving relationships that we enjoy from day to day, but your salvation shown in Jesus, our Savior. We pray a, f a prayer of forgiveness at the close of this year, for we have not held you above all gods that have had sway and pull in our lives. We have not remembered you as honorable and even in the name Christian we wear we have disgraced you and ourselves at times. We have taken your name lightly upon our lips and we have failed to live out the graciousness of the rest that you gave us in the Sabbath. We have not always treated those in authority over us with respect, including our parents and others of our families, but also in society. We have participated in the deaths of others through the way in which our society functions and by our own evil and wicked thoughts. We have not been faithful to all of our relationships that bless us and sometimes we have not blessed in return. We have not always been true to the property rights of others and have stolen little and great by some of our actions and deeds. We have not always spoken the truth and we know that it is easy sometimes to be devious in the gossip that we raise. And we have not always been content with our lot in life, for we have greatly desired things that probably are unattainable or belong to others. But now as we close out this year with our confessions, we also receive and pledge to you for the new year those things that we wish and you wish for us, we want to be more loving. We want to enjoy and be joyful. We want to have peace and be peacemakers. We want and pledge ourselves to greater patience with those around us. We wish to be kind, so fulfill that desire in us that we may express the kindness you have shown to us. We really, truly want to be good. Teach us your ways that we might also be good in your steps. We want to be faithful to those that are part of our families and our work teams, to those in our societies that need our care. We want to be gentle. We remember, Jesus, how gentle you are and were with us and those around us. And we want to have self-control, for we do not want any darkness to be the master of our lives. So take from us those things where we have dishonored ourselves and you, 
and give us the fruit of the Spirit that we may live lives more abundantly. We seek this and we pledge ourselves to it as the year of our Lord 2019 approaches. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. Chuck Swindle remembers hearing of a couple that were living back in the upper Appalachians in a place that was not frequented by many others outside of the local community. There weren't too many choices for schooling, there weren't choices for shopping, there weren't many choices for work. And so much of life was directed and pledged in particular directions that were set by society, including often the selection of marriage partners. This teenage boy and this teenage girl were about the only two to select from in their community, and so they got married. And before some time happened, uh, they had a child, and they called the child very creatively Junior. And uh, Pa and Ma and Junior had a wonderful life together back in the hills. Until Junior got older and was becoming interested in the world outside of the holler. So he decided that he was going to go to a place that he had heard about called the Big City. Nobody knew quite where the Big City was, but he was going to find the Big City. And he was determined he was going to get there. Well, Pa and Ma debated this for a little while. They hadn't left the holler since they'd been born. And now that Junior was going, they were quite attached to him and figured that if he had to go see the world out there and the big city, that maybe they should go with him. So Pa went across two ravines and over to the neighbors who were some miles away to borrow an old pickup truck. And he drove it through the woods to their place and Ma collected her her best things in her purse, and uh, she sat in the middle seat, and Pa was stiffly at the wheel of the pickup truck, and Junior was on the other side waiting for the big city and all that the world would bring out there. They drove down the rutted roads to the logging road, and then down the logging road to the gravel road, and then down the gravel road to the paved road, and then they hadn't been on the paved road very long before it kind of merged naturally into this massive superhighway with trucks and vehicles whizzing by. And Pa was greatly feared about driving in this place, but he managed to go along and get into the lane and managed to stay right there at a, at a solid 35 miles an hour as traffic was whizzing around him. The traffic pulled and pulled and pulled them into the big city, and it was awesome. Pa was stiffly at the wheel, Ma was clutching her purse tightly and eyes straight ahead, and Junior was hanging out the window trying to drink in everything he was seeing in the big city. The traffic pulled them right to the center of the city where there were huge buildings reaching up to the sky, higher than the mountains it seemed. And finally they were pulled to a stop. And so Junior and Pa decided that they would get out and see what was there in the big city. And they got out, left Ma in the truck, and they went over to this place that was all reflecting the sky. Was it glass? Could it be? They got closer, and all of a sudden, the doors opened just for them. Unbelievable. And they walked inside with the others, and inside there were trees and there were birds flying around, and there were light, and there was music, and they couldn't even find the musicians. It was just unbelievable. And while they were in this place, Pa saw something that he could not figure out. There was a woman, she was quite well along in years, so much so that she needed a cane in order to sort of hobble along. She was wearing a beautiful fur coat. She went toward a wall, and there was really nothing at this wall except some lights, and she took her cane, and she pressed one of the lights, and suddenly these doors opened like that, and there was a little room on the other side, 
And she hobbled into this little room, and then the doors closed behind her, and there was nothing in there. Paul went over there and banged on the doors because he was afraid for this woman. She was caught in this place. What was going to happen? And he saw the lights, and they kept going higher and higher numbers, and then they came down again. And then he was thankful because finally the door slid open again, and there she was in her fur coat, but no cane. She looked like a movie star, and she walked out all by herself. And Pa said to Junior, go get Ma. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice at the end of the year, making a New Year's resolution, step into a little booth, and there you go, and it's all yours, just like that. Well, it doesn't always happen that way, does it? And, and one of the things that I, I think about Christmas uh, our society gears us up for this big rush. Buy your presents. Get the things you need. Celebrate the holidays, you know, and then you got to recover from them. The story itself is not like that. It kind of edges in in the Gospels, and then we sit. We sit. We sit with a baby, and here we are carrying on with life. Society has its own agenda, but the church says, here's where the story is just beginning to unfold. Notice how Luke tells us things that we don't often read because we stop at the great event. But here's what happens next. On the eighth day, this is the eighth day of Jesus' life, on the eighth day when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male child, male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom, what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light to the rev uh, for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher, she was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. That's what happened next. That's the next chapter in the story. And it's a chapter about power, but power in strange ways that we don't often think of them. Power for us is often position. Someone has a position in the government. Someone has power over us. Someone can say, jump, and we say, how high? They can say, go, and we say, how far? They can say, do this, and we say, how long? Power is position. Machiavelli wrote that in his book that still is a bestseller and still is on the nightstands of all who are or would be leaders of nations, the prince the power that comes by ruling with fear and might, 
the power that comes by positional authority. Some years ago, Robert Ringer played on that in a book that he called Winning Through Intimidation. And we think about power with that kind of might and push. And Shakespeare himself got in on the act in his great drama, King Lear, where King Lear has lived out a full life and has been a benevolent ruler. And now as he enters that last phase of his existence, he wants to bless his people one more time, but especially his family, and he's the father of three daughters. I know what that's like. And so he says to his daughters that he will divide his kingdom in three parts and give to each of them a portion so that they may become rulers and share with him. And then in his waning years, he will go from one castle to the next, from one house to the next, and live in the presence of his daughters as they have often lived in his presence. Well, you know the story that two out of the three daughters have been uh, looking for this moment so that the power positions change. And where their father was the one that they thought was an autocrat over them, them, they now become the autocrats and they shunt him away. He no longer has a place in their kingdoms. They have power. And he becomes a desperate old man, only his youngest daughter. And he, too late he finds this to be the case, is the one who loves him not out of power, but for himself. The power, the position uh, of power. Sometimes in our lives we think of power in terms of performance. Just how much can we get out of that engine? Just how fast can it go? Rolls-Royce was said to have released a number of its vehicles early on in South Africa, purchased by one oil or um, diamond tycoon who uh, wanted to know more of the specs on this Rolls-Royce that he had. But there's never any accompanying information with a Rolls-Royce. And so he went to the dealer, and the dealer said, well, I'll have to get back from the factory. And he sent back to the factory. And finally, finally, the word came that they had the results, how much power that engine would develop. And it was only one word, enough, enough. Well, sometimes, you know, the power of performance. Can we do this? Do we have the strength to do this? Are we able to do this? Can we amass the leverage to do this? Rudyard Kipling, when his son was born, uh, penned a poem that's been recited in a number of settings, uh, always for uh, in encouragement and making it. It's called If. It goes through a number of stanzas. If you can do this, and 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 it ends with those words. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds of distance run, you'll be, yours is the world, my son, and everything in it, and what is more, you'll be a man. Well, someone was reciting that at one of these, uh, these, uh, company gatherings where everybody's getting hyped up and after that speaker had said that in the pregnant pause afterwards there was a voice from near the back of the room but what if you can't but what if you can't you know what happens to those of us who aren't going to make it to the top of the list to those of us who don't get what we want to those of us who have prayed and failed to those who have tried and didn't succeed Harry Emerson Fosdick had a sermon that he preached a number of times. He called it handling life's second bests. We make our plans. We try to put out the effort. We seek to succeed, and yet somehow it doesn't seem to happen for us. And then what? What if we are not able to provide power in performance? Well, what about partnership? Sitting at the table the other day with my brother and sister-in-law and their family. And their son is getting ready to graduate from college and he needs to find a job. And he knows that one of my sons-in-law works for a major corporation. Hey, maybe you can connect with him. You know, it's not, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. 
And so we have this idea of partnerships that maybe we can, we can find a way in the door that power comes through knowing the right people in the right circumstances at the right times. But sometimes we don't know the right people or the circumstances aren't right. And it's always that judicious thing like John Locke said in his, his ideas about the social contract. I will, you know, make a deal with you, but what if you are more powerful than I am? We keep hearing about the NAFTA and how it's being realigned, the North American Free Trade Agreement of years ago that now is being refigured and reconditioned. And one person who's from Canada was talking to me all about it, and he was giving me all kinds of free political advice. Can you imagine? I didn't even have to pay him for it. He had all of this free political advice. And we were talking about the, those things, and he says, uh, yeah, it's easy for you people in the States to talk about these things. But just remember that when an elephant and a mouse make an agreement together, if the mouse ro uh, rolls over sleeping at night, the elephant doesn't feel it. But if the elephant rolls over, it's everything for the mouse. And there's this unequal partnership that's there, this unequal partnership, so that we suddenly become aware, even in our partnership desires, that power may not be something that benefits us there. And that's where this all comes in, because Simeon is not a powerful person. He's lived out the better part of his days. And Anna, did you get that? She had married, and after seven years, her husband had died. And suddenly, in a male-dominated society, she has no one to be that link for her to the power brokers. Eighty-four years old, and still waiting for someone to help her out. And even Joseph and Mary, Luke tells us, they did according to the law on the eighth day. They went to Jerusalem. It was about five miles away from Bethlehem. They went up there and they went to the temple to uh, have uh, the priests circumcise their young lad. And they brought an offering according to the law, says Luke. And that offering, he says, was two turtle doves or two pigeons. Do you know that that's the wrong offering to bring? According to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the right offering to bring at the time of a circumcision is a young goat. But here's the thing. If, said the law, if, said God, if you are so poor that you can't even afford to buy or raise a young goat, then you may bring two little birds that you can catch. What Luke is telling us is that even Joseph and Mary, having been given the gift of all things, here's Mary. How old? Maybe in her mid-teens, maybe a little bit older. Can you imagine that? And every night and every morning she says her prayers and she never mentions the name of God for to mention the name of God is impossible. Instead, she pronounces Adonai, which means the one who is Lord over me. The Jews by this time had said it's too hard to pronounce the name of God for we may be pronouncing God's name and our thoughts may be taken away and we will take the name of our God in vain. And so she was this wisp of a girl in her teens. And suddenly this angel, messenger of the Most High, comes and tells her, you have found favor. And one will grow inside of you who is the Almighty himself. And suddenly the nameless one becomes her child and takes on a name. And here Mary and Joseph with this great gift they can't even afford the right sacrifice. So poor they are. So if this power that's coming into the world, as Simeon talks about it, 
if this destiny of the nations, as Anna the prophet says, has happened, is here. So we who live this side of Christmas, what exactly is it? Not necessarily the power of position. Not necessarily the power of performance. Not even necessarily the power of partnership. It's a different kind of thing. When we were packing up the belongings of my parents after my dad died in March, there were two little wooden carvings that were there and they brought back memories. One Christmas in the poverty of my student life, all I gave to my parents were wooden carvings. The one was carved M-O-M, and they were linked together. And the other was carved D-A-D, and they were linked together. But on the front of each was a kind of brass-colored plate. And the plate on each said this. Mom is the name for God on the lips of a child. Dad is the name for God on the lips of a child. And I remembered so well what I was thinking about. For as I was growing up, I wouldn't have known God were it not for my parents. I wouldn't have known about God were it not for those who brought me into this world and raised me. And much of my life depended on my parents not giving me everything, but simply being there for me. Calvin Miller remembers it well. Six years old and off to school for the first time. First day of school, back in the days when there aren't computers, there aren't electronic records. And so part of the day involves each student going up to the teacher's desk and she has to fill out the rest of the information for the forms that the school needs so it can process each student. So it's Calvin's time to come up to the desk. And the teacher, wonderful woman, says, Now, Calvin, what's your mama's name? And he says, Mama. And the teacher says, No, Calvin, Mama is what you call her. What's her name? And Calvin gets a little upset. Her name is Mama. No, Calvin, uh, you call her mama because she's your mama, but she also has an, uh, she does not, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to tell her you said that. And so Calvin came storming home at the end of the school day, and he went into the house, and he said, Mama, my teacher said that you have another name. And his mama sat him down at the table, and she said to him, It's true, Calvin, I have another name. You call me Mama, but my name is Ethel. And Calvin says, Ooh, that sounded so terrible, like she ought to have a sister that was named a regular or unleaded. <laughs> and then her mom, his mom said, And I have another name, too. It's Faye. Now his whole world was beginning to collapse. He didn't know what to think anymore. And then she said to him, and I have a third name, and my name is Miller. Miller, that's my name. She has my name. And suddenly, mother, who was God to him, who was up after he went to bed, who was up in the morning before he got up, who prepared all meals, who took care of his clothing, who placed everything at his behest, Mama, who was God to him, became like him. She was one exactly like him. The power was not in position. The power was not just in performance. The power was not even in partnership. But the power was in the presence that changed and affected every portion of his life. So Mary and Joseph go home. And God simply lives with them. God simply lives with them. The power of presence 
in their lives. Um, David James Duncan, a uh, 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 professor over at the uh, University of uh, Virginia, wrote a powerful book some years ago as a sociologist. He studies the way that cultures move and change and shift. And he's also an evangelical Christian, and so he wants these, these worlds to come together. His book is to change the world. It's one of the most uh, wonderful books I've read. But he says, we as Christians so often think that we can manipulate the powers in order to present ourselves in society. In the end, he says that when we try to manipulate the powers, we either lose power ourselves or we warp our existence in such a way that the true power of God is no longer evident in us or through us. And he talks about coming to terms with what he calls faithful presence. Just living with God in such a way that everything about us takes that into account and suddenly the power of eternity is expressed in the glow of the existence of our lives. Chuck Colson found that out some years ago when he was alive and when he, after he had spent time in jail because of his devious dealings with one of our former presidents, uh, he founded prison ministries, prison fellowship. And uh, he had been invited to various places around the world to view various institutions, to talk with inmates, and to set up present prison fellowships in various uh, situations. He was invited to Brazil, and at uh, San Jose de Campos, uh, he was uh, asked if he wanted to go to Humaita prison. That prison was one of the most notorious in the Brazilian penal system. More prisoners had died there than had come out alive, so much so that it was being decommissioned and it was going to be shuttered, and everybody was breathing a sigh of relief. It was a notoriously bad institution. And in that process, a number of Christians in San Jose de Campos uh, asked if they could take over the prison and maintain it as a prison. Now, they weren't allowed to have it at the same kind of level of security uh, that it had been before, but they were able to take over the prison and where the recidivism rate for all of the prisons in Brazil was similar to that in the world uh, population, about 75% of those who are released from prisons will eventually appear back in the system again. Uh, over the course of the next decade, the recidivism uh, rate at Humaita prison dropped to 4%, 4%. And now Chuck Colson was being invited there to look at what was going on in this prison. There were many things happening, great things that he's written about. But at one point during his tour, they asked him if he wanted to see the prisoner who was in the solitary confinement cell at the center of the prison. And fearful because he had been in those places before and knowing the stench and, and the rage that was often accompanied with that, he agreed to go. And they led him down some dark corridors to a place at the very heart of the prison where there was this huge iron gate and they put the key in and they pulled the door open. And he saw, as he stepped into the cell, this small place, very clean, very neat. One bulb coming down from the ceiling, giving enough light to see. Painted walls, a table, and some flowers in a vase. And on the wall, Jesus on the cross. And a banner that read, Estamos juntos. He is one of us. This is what changed and transformed the worst prison in Brazil to becoming a place of healing and hope for those who came through it. Not because they were coerced by power which forced them, not because they were able to prove that they were good enough for society, not even because they managed to make a deal that got them out on time, but understanding that the one who holds all sorts of power gave it up to spend time in our world, wearing our clothes, sharing our names. 
the word of the Father became Mary's little son and his love, the power of his presence reached all the way to where we were. Whatever it is that you need as we make this transition from one year into the next, whatever it is that you gained or lost through the holiday season, whatever it is that your life is begging for and trying to find, there is something that you cannot ignore or deny in the person and presence of Jesus. Sometimes a bolt of blue comes out of the skies and our lives are transformed. But for most of us, it's simply acknowledging day by day that while the skies are gray and the days often get long and tedious, God lives, God exists, God shares God's presence with us and the whole system of power in our universe is tilted in the direction of heaven. Pray with me. Jesus, we know that you know us better than we know ourselves. We trust you today to keep on giving the gift of Christmas. Not the niceties and the uh, songs and the blinking lights and the things that are thrown away and trashed, but the presence of your daily commitment to us. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. What can others do to me? Give us that confidence as we move ahead, knowing that the balance of power in our world, mighty as it is, has shifted toward eternity. And we trust in you. In your name we pray.